Hello and welcome back to Pale Blue Thoughts. Sorry for not uploading videos over the last couple of weeks as I was busy preparing for the evolution discussion at Litmus 22. Proud to tell you that the event went wonderfully well and the turnout was overwhelming. Lots of questions were posed at the question and answer session which made me realize that there are still people who are unsure of what evolution is. Most importantly, they are unaware that evolution has a lot of evidence in its favor and the lack of awareness of this causes them to dismiss evolution as just a theory with no evidence. So today I will present some simple, easy to understand evidence that proves that evolution is a fact. My name is Anand and welcome to Pale Blue Thoughts, the channel which promotes scientific temper and debunks pseudoscience. Before we go into the evidence, let us see what evolution is and how it occurs. Simply put, biological evolution is genetic change in a population from one generation to another. The speed and direction of change may be different in different species and may occur at different times. Continuous evolution over many generations can result in the development of new varieties and species. Likewise, failure to evolve in response to environmental changes can and often does lead to extinction of a species. Biologists sometimes define two types of evolution based on their time scales. The first one, macroevolution, which refers to large scale changes that occur over extended time periods, such as the formation of new species. Microevolution, which refers to small scale changes that affect just one or a few genes and can happen in populations over shorter time scales. It is important to note that microevolution and macroevolution are not two different processes. They are the same process, evolution, occurring on different time scales. Microevolutionary process occurring over thousands or millions of years can add up to large scale changes that make new species or groups. In this video, we will examine the evidence for evolution on both macro and micro scales. When scientists speak of evolution as a theory, they do not mean that it is just a mere speculation. It is a theory in the same sense as the earth is round rather than flat or that our bodies are made of atoms are theories. As a result of the massive amount of evidence for biological evolution accumulated over the last two centuries, we can safely conclude that evolution has occurred and continues to occur. All life forms, including humans, evolved from earlier species and all still living species of organisms continue to evolve even today. Biological scientists accept that primordial life on earth began as a result of chance natural occurrences some 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. This theory about the origin of the first life is called abiogenesis. Abiogenesis and evolution are different. Evolution kicks in only once the first life forms came into existence. That is, first there is abiogenesis then evolution takes charge to create the varied variety of life we see today. So how do we know that evolution has occurred? Evidence number one, genetics and anatomy. Species may share similar physical features because the feature was present in their common ancestor. These are called homologous structures. Living things on earth are fundamentally similar in their basic anatomical structures and in their chemical compositions. No matter whether they are simple single cell bacteria or highly complex organisms with billions of cells like humans, they all begin as single cells that reproduce themselves via cell division. After a limited lifespan, they all grow old and die. All living things on earth share the ability to create complex molecules out of carbon and a few other elements. In fact, 99% of the proteins, carbohydrates, fats and other molecules of living things are made from only 6 of the 92 most common elements. This cannot be a mere coincidence. All plants and animals receive their specific characteristics from their parents by inheriting some particular combinations of genes. Genes combine to form the DNA within our cells. These segments of DNA contain chemically coded recipes for creating proteins by linking together particular amino acids in specific sequences. All of the tens of thousands of types of proteins in living things are mostly made of only 20 kinds of amino acids. 
Despite the great diversity of life on our planet, the DNA is the same for all living things. This is evidence of the fundamental molecular unity of life. These shared features suggest that all living things are descended from a common ancestor and that is this ancestor had DNA as its genetic material, used the genetic code and expressed its genes by transcription and translation. Present day organisms all share these features because they were inherited from the common ancestor. Although they are great for establishing the common origins of life, features like having similar genetic structure are not so useful for figuring out how related particular organisms are. If we want to determine which organisms in a group are most closely related, we need to use different types of molecular features such as the nucleotide sequences of genes. Biologists often compare the sequences of related genes found in different species often called as homologous or orthologous genes to figure out how these species are evolutionarily related to one another. The basic idea behind this approach is of course that two species have the same gene because they inherited it from a common ancestor. For instance, humans, cows, chickens and chimpanzees all have a gene that converts the hormone insulin because this gene was already present in their last common ancestor. In general, the more DNA differences in homologous genes between two species, the relation between the two species decreases. For instance, human and chimpanzee insulin proteins are much more similar, they are almost 98% identical than human and chicken insulin proteins which are only 64% identical. This clearly shows that humans and chimpanzees are more closely related than humans and chickens. In addition to molecular similarities, most living things are alike in that they either get the energy needed for growth, repair and reproduction directly from sunlight by either photosynthesis like done in plants or they get indirectly by consuming the plants and other organisms that eat those plants. Many species share the same types of body structures because they inherited them from a common ancestor that had them. This is very evident in the case of vertebrates which are the animals that have internal skeletons. The arms of humans, the forelegs of dogs and cats, the wings of birds and the flippers of whales and seals all have the same type of bones because they have retained these traits of their shared common ancient vertebrate ancestor. See these pictures of the forelimbs of whales, humans, birds and dogs. They may look pretty different on the outside. That is because they are adapted to function in different environments. However, if you look at the bone structure of the forelimbs, you will find that the pattern of bones is very similar across these species. It is unlikely that such similar structures would have evolved independently in each species and more likely that the basic layout of bones was already present in a common ancestor of whales, humans, dogs and birds. Some homologous structures can only be seen in embryos. For instance, all vertebrate embryos including humans have gill slits and a tail during early development like what we see in fishes and aquatic animals. The development patterns of these become more different as it develops further which is why your embryonic tail is now your tailbone and your gill slits have turned into your jaw and inner ear. Sometimes organisms have structures that are homologous to important structures in other organisms but they have lost their major ancestral function. These structures which are often reduced in size are known as vestigial structures. Examples of vestigial structures include the tailbone of humans, the hind leg bones of whales and the underdeveloped legs found in some snakes. To make things a little more interesting and complicated, not all physical features that look alike are marks of common ancestry. Instead, some physical similarities are analogous. They evolved independently in different organisms because the organisms lived in similar environments or experienced similar selective pressures. This process is called convergent evolution. To converge means to come together like two lines meeting at a common point. For example, two distantly related species that live in the Arctic, the Arctic fox and a bird named ptarmigan both undergo seasonal changes of color from dark to snowy white. This shared feature does not reflect common ancestry. That is, it is unlikely that the last common ancestor of the fox and the bird changed color with the seasons. Instead, this feature was favored separately in both species 
due to similar selective pressures. That is, this ability to switch to light coloration in winter helped both foxes and ptarmigans survive and reproduce in a place with snowy winters and sharp-eyed predators. In general, biologists don't draw conclusions about how species are related on the basis of any single feature they think is homologous. Instead, they study a large collection of features, often both physical features and the DNA, and then draw conclusions about relatedness based on these features as a group. All of these major chemical and anatomical similarities between living things can be most logically accounted for by assuming that they either share a common ancestry or they came into existence as a result of similar natural processes. These facts makes it difficult to accept a theory of an independent creation of different species by a supernatural creator. Not convinced? Here is evidence number two geographic distribution of later species or biogeography. The geographic distribution of organisms on earth follows patterns that are best explained by evolution in combination with the movement of tectonic plates over geological time. For example, broad groupings of organisms that had already evolved before the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea about 200 million years ago tend to be distributed worldwide. In contrast, Broad groupings that evolved after the breakup tend to appear uniquely in small regions of Earth. For instance, there are unique groups of plants and animals on northern and southern continents that can be traced to the split of Pangaea into two supercontinents as Laurasia in the north and Gondwana land in the south. The evolution of unique species on islands is another example of how evolution has occurred. For instance, most of the mammal species in Australia are marsupials which carry young in a pouch, while most mammal species elsewhere in the world are placental, that is, they nourish young through the placenta. For instance, before humans arrived there, Australia had more than 100 species of kangaroos, koalas and other marsupials, but none of the more advanced placental mammals such as dogs, cats, bears and horses. Land mammals were entirely absent from the even more isolated islands that make up Hawaii and New Zealand. Each of these places had a great number of plant, insect and bird species that were found nowhere else in the world. The most likely explanation for the existence of Australia's, New Zealand's and Hawaii's most unique biotic environments is that the life forms in these areas have been evolving in isolation from the rest of the world for millions of years. Because these islands were isolated by water for millions of years, these species were able to evolve without competition from mammal species elsewhere in the world. Number 3. Fossil Records Fossils are the preserved remains of previously living organisms or their traces dating from the distant past. Most creationists and people who do not understand evolution tend to base their evidence on fossil records to disprove evolution. The problem with fossil records is that they are not complete or unbroken. Most organisms never fossilize and even the organisms that do fossilize are rarely found by humans. But the crucial thing is that we no longer need fossils to prove evolution. We have all the evidence without the need for fossils today. Darwin in his days had to resort to fossils to prove his theory. However, after Gregor Mendel discovered genetics and the huge advances that we have made since in that field renders fossils unneeded. Nonetheless, the fossils that humans have collected offer unique insights into evolution over long time scales. How can the age of fossils be determined? First, fossils are often contained in rocks that build up in layers called strata. The strata provide a sort of a timeline with layers near the top being newer and layers near the bottom being older. Fossils found in different strata at the same site can be ordered by their positions and this can be used to compare the ages of fossils across locations. Scientists can roughly date fossils using radiometric dating, a process that measures the radioactive decay of certain elements. Everything in science has to be falsifiable. So how can we falsify evolution? Simple, if you find a stratum of rock and you find both rabbits and dinosaurs in it, then evolution can be proven false. Why? Because as per evolution, rabbits evolved millions of years after dinosaurs and they just couldn't coexist 
and hence cannot be found in the same stratum. Opponents of evolution point to gaps in the fossil record as proof that the theory is invalid. They say the fossil record fails to show what are called as transitional forms or missing links. Generally, the in-between stages as one type of creature evolved into another. Contrary to their statements, we have many, many fossils that illustrate evolutionary transitions between fish and amphibians, between reptiles and mammals, between dinosaurs and birds, and in many lineages such as whales and horses. And new fossils continue to reveal transitional forms that some said doesn't exist. The more we learn about the evolution of specific species, the more these so-called gaps or missing links in the chain of evolution are filled with transitional fossil specimens. One of the first gaps to be filled was between the small bipedal dinosaurs and birds. Just two years after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, a 150 to 145 million year old fossil of Archaeopteryx was found in southern Germany. It had jaws with teeth and a long bony tail like dinosaurs, broad wings and feathers like birds and skeletal features of both. This discovery verified the assumption that birds had reptilian ancestors. Since the discovery of the Archaeopteryx, there have been many other crucial evolutionary gaps filled in the fossil record. Perhaps the most important one from a human perspective was that between apes and our own species. Since the 1920s, there have been literally hundreds of well-dated intermediate fossils found in Africa that were transitional species leading from apes to humans over the last few million years. The fossil record also provides abundant evidence that the complex animals and plants of today were preceded by earlier simpler ones. In addition, it shows that multicellular organisms evolved only after the first single-celled ones. That fits the predictions of evolutionary theory. Are you still not convinced? How about doing an experiment to see evolution happen right in front of your eyes? There is this experiment which has been conducted called the Microbial Evolution and Growth Arena or Mega Plate Experiment. First, they filled a petri dish with a bacteria named E. coli. Next, the researchers divided the mega plate into sections and added increasing doses of an antibiotic, trimethoprim. Because it is harmful for the bacteria, most of them die off. However, a few of the bacteria usually are immune and survive. The next generation is mostly immune because they have inherited immunity from the survivors. This same phenomenon of bacteria evolution speeded up by human actions occurs in our own bodies at times when an antibiotic drug is unable to completely eliminate a bacterial infection. That is the reason that doctors insist that the full dosage is to be used even if the symptoms of illnesses go away. They do not want to allow any potentially antibiotic resistant bacteria to survive. This kind of evolution is what we call as microevolution. The same phenomenon can be seen in the emergence of drug resistant bacteria and pesticide resistant insects. For example, in the 1950s, there was a worldwide effort to eradicate malaria by eliminating certain mosquitoes. The pesticide DDT was sprayed broadly in areas where mosquitoes lived and at first, the DDT was highly effective at killing the mosquitoes. However, over time, the DDT became less and less effective and more and more mosquitoes survived. This was because the mosquito population evolved resistance to the pesticide. The reason why we use microbes and insects for these experiments is because they tend to evolve over relatively short time periods and we can observe their evolution directly. Much has been added to our understanding of the nature of evolution since the 19th century. It is now known that there are at least six different processes that can operate independently or together to bring about evolution. The understanding of these processes has become the basis of an overall synthetic theory of evolution. This theory has multiple causes including Charles Darwin's concept of natural selection, Gregor Mendel's genetic inheritance as well as several crucial 20th century discoveries. That can be discussed on another video later. I hope you liked today's episode. Please do share this video with your friends and to people who are creationists. It is time they understand that evolution is a fact and that we are not created by some supernatural creator. I shall be back soon with another interesting episode. Until then, it's bye-bye from Pale Blue Thoughts.